is doing everything they can to convince Hoosiers this race is over. So they only report on the polls showing Donald up. You don't report on the polls showing me up. Which polls show you up? Uh, there was a poll just three days ago here in Indiana that was done that showed me up by double digits. But listen, there is also a broader dynamic. There is a broader dynamic at work, which is network executives have made a decision to get behind Donald Trump. Rupert Murdoch and Roger Ailes at Fox News have turned Fox News into the Donald Trump network 24-7. Now, Rupert Murdoch is used to picking world leaders in Australia and the United Kingdom, running tabloids. And we're seeing it here at home with well, the consequences for this nation. Media executives are trying to convince Hoosiers, trying to convince Americans the race is decided. You have no choice. You are stuck between Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, either one of which the screenwriter says that he based the character Biff Tannen on Donald Trump. A caricature of a braggadocious, arrogant buffoon who builds giant casinos with giant pictures of him everywhere he looks. We are looking, potentially, at the Biff Tannen presidency. I don't think the people of America want that. I don't think we deserve that. I don't think Hoosiers want that. Senator, these are some of the strongest words you've used against Donald Trump yet. You know I've been with you. I've heard you talk about him. Today feels different for you. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask you a question, and you're going to say I sound like a broken record, and you're going to say that Donald Trump well, cannot... If you sound like a broken record, someone else have a question? But, no, but Senator, no, no. why you've not asked say one already, Hallie. You, you've Senator, asked, you've you've asked will already. you support him as the nominee? You I don't understand why you won't answer it. The question, the Senator. Judgment. If you say he's a liar, Jess, I'm sorry, yeah. but if you say he's a pathological liar, and you say that you can't... Hallie, you've asked one already. But why not definitively say... Go ahead, Jessica. Senator, when you talk about about Midwestern values and the common sense and the good judgment. If Indiana Hoosiers don't pick you today, does that make you reconsider things in a different way than when the Northeast voted and you could say that was Trump's neighbors voting? Really? Uh, listen, there is no doubt this Indiana primary has national significance. The media is trying desperately to convince you it's over. I'll tell you, if Hoosiers come out today and vote, if you pick up the phone and you call your friends, you call your neighbors, if Hoosiers come out today and vote and say, no, this is not who we are, this is not America, that will change the entire trajectory of this campaign, of this primary. It will pull us back from the cliff. Indiana can do it. Indiana can pull us back, but it takes Hoosiers showing up and voting today and the country is looking to Indiana, is looking to the judgment of the good men and women of this state. Heidi and I and Carly, we have traveled the state showing Hoosiers respect, asking for their support, answering their questions, all the while Donald Trump laughs at the people of this state. He laughs bullies, attacks, insults. I don't believe that's America. And it is my hope, it is my prayer, that Hoosiers will come out and vote today in record numbers to say to this country, this is not who we are. We are a people who believe in goodness. We are a people who believe in manners. We are a people who believe in generosity. We are a people who believe in honesty. We are a people who believe in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That is America. That is the America I love. It's the America my father fled Cuba to come to. We're fighting for this nation. We're fighting for who we are, for the very soul and character of this nation. And it is quite literally in the hands of Hoosiers across the state. Well, what if they don't pick you? Senator, if they don't pick you, what does that say about Indiana? Lots to digest from what we just saw. Uh, Republican strategist Susan Del Percio is with me. Uh, Susan, you have mm -hmm. Ted Cruz now as voting is going on right now in Indiana, watching potentially the end for him if Donald Trump is successful. According to the polls, many are saying this is all but done. How do you process what he just said of the front runner? I cannot. He is right now speaking. Uh, a lot going on with his campaign. Let's listen in. 
and uh, appreciate your putting a bright smile on it. Um, listen, it's up to the voters. It is up to the people of Indiana. It is up to the men of this state. I will say this. This morning, Donald Trump went on national television and attacked my father. Donald Trump alleges that my dad was involved in assassinating JFK. Now, let's be clear. This is nuts. This is not a reasonable position. This is just kooky. And while I'm at it, I guess I should go ahead and admit, yes, my dad killed JFK. He is secretly Elvis and, J and Jimmy Hoffa is buried in his backyard. You know, Donald's source for this is the National Enquirer. The National Enquirer is tabloid trash, but it's run by his good friend, David Pecker, the CEO, who's endorsed Donald Trump. And so the National Enquirer has become his hit piece that he uses to smear anybody and everybody. And this is not the first time Donald Trump has used David Pecker's National Enquirer to go after my family. It was also the National Enquirer that went after my wife, Heidi that just spread lies, blatant lies. But I guess Donald was dismayed because it was a couple of weeks ago the Inquirer wrote this idiotic story about JFK. And Donald was dismayed that, that the folks in the media weren't repeating this latest idiocy, so he figured he'd have to do it himself. He'd have to go on national television and accuse my dad of that. Listen, my father has been my hero my whole life. My dad was imprisoned and tortured in Cuba. And when he came to America, he had nothing. He had $100 in his underwear. He washed dishes making 50 cents an hour. You know, he's exactly the kind of person Donald Trump looks down on. I'm going to do something I haven't done for the entire campaign. For those of y'all who have traveled with me all across the country, I'm going to tell you what I really think. This man is a pathological liar. He doesn't know the difference between truth and lies. He lies practically every word that comes out of his mouth. And in a pattern that I think is straight out of a psychology textbook, his response is to accuse everybody else of lying. He accuses everybody on that debate stage of lying. And it's simply a mindless yell. Whatever he does, he accuses everyone else of doing. The man ca cannot tell the truth, but he combines it with being a narcissist. A narcissist at a level... I don't think this country's ever seen. Donald Trump is such a narcissist that Barack Obama looks at him and goes, dude, what's your problem? Everything in Donald's world is about Donald. And he combines being a pathological liar. And I say pathological because I actually think Donald, if you hooked him up to a lie detector test, he could say one thing in the morning, one thing at noon, and one thing in the evening, all contradictory, and he'd pass the lie detector test each time. Whatever lie he's telling, at that minute, he believes it. But the man is utterly amoral. Well, let, let, let me finish this, please. The man is utterly amoral. It, morality does not exist for him. It's why... He went after Heidi directly and smeared my wife, attacked her. Apparently, she's not pretty enough for Donald Trump. I may be biased, but I think if he's making that allegation, he's also legally blind. But Donald is a bully. He visited with fifth graders. Every one of us knew bullies in elementary school. Bullies don't come from strength. Bullies come from weakness. Bullies come from a deep, yawning cavern of insecurity. There is a reason Donald builds giant buildings and puts his name on them everywhere he goes. And I will say, there are millions of people in this country who are angry. They're angry at Washington. They're angry at politicians who've lied to them. I understand that anger. I share that anger. And Donald is cynically exploiting that anger, and he is lying to his supporters. Donald will betray his supporters on every issue.
If you care about immigration, Donald is laughing at you. And he's telling the money to elites. He doesn't believe what he's saying. He's not going to build a wall. That's what he told the New York Times. He will betray you on every issue across the board. And his strategy of being a bully, in particular, is directed at women. Donald has a real problem with women. People who are insecure, people who are insecure about who they are, Donald is terrified by strong women. He lashes out at them. Remember, this is the same Donald Trump who last week here in Indiana proudly touted the endorsement from Mike Tyson. A convicted rapist who served three years in prison here in Indiana for raping a 17-year-old girl. And in Donald's world, he said Mike Tyson was a tough guy. I don't think rapists are tough guys. I spent a lot of years in law enforcement dealing with rapists. Rapists are weak, they are cowards, and they're bullies. And anyone that thinks they're a tough guy, that reveals everything. Donald Trump's character. Donald Trump said Bill Clinton was targeted by unattractive women. You know what? I've been blessed to be surrounded by strong women my entire life. Today is voting day here in Indiana. The President of the United States has a bully pulpit unlike anybody else. The President of the United States affects our culture. I ask the people of Indiana, think about the next five years if this man were to become president. Think about the next five years, the boasting, the pathological lying, the picking up the National Enquirer and accusing people of killing JFK, the bullying, Think about your kids coming back and emulating this. For people in Indiana who long for a day when we were nice to each other, when we treated people with respect, when we didn't engage in sleaze and lies, and I would know one of the lies he engages in, listen, Donald Trump is a serial philanderer, and he boasts about it. This is not a secret. He's proud of being a serial philanderer. I want everyone to think about your teenage kids. The President of the United States talks about how great it is to commit adultery, how proud he is. Describes his battles with venereal disease as his own personal Vietnam. That's a quote, by the way, on the Howard Stern show. Do you want to spend the next five years with your kids? Bragging about infidelity? Now, what does he do? He does the same projection, just like a pathological liar he accuses of lying. Even though he boasts about his infidelity, he plants in David Pecker's National Enquirer a lie about me and my family, attacking my family. He accuses others of doing what he is doing. I'll tell you, as the father of two young girls, the idea of our daughters coming home and repeating any word that man says horrifies me. That is not who America is. And I would say to the Hoosier state, the entire country is depending on you. Yeah. And, and can, we see, can we take a look at Ted Cruz? How do you think sure. he's handling these last few days? From going with a case of collusion, of course, going, uh, going ahead and naming a running mate, and then doing a lot of confrontations on the Sunday shows, and then this with a protester who didn't confront him. He confronted a Trump supporter. Listen. And line Ted. Well, sir, you know, actually, civilized people don't just scream and yell at each other. I'm not yelling at you. You are the problem. Let me ask you, you something, You are the problem, right, you, politician. You are the problem. Can, can I ask you something? No. Can I ask you no. something? You are Out of all of the candidates, name one who had a million-dollar judgment against him for hiring illegal aid. Name one. Donald Trump is the only one. Uh, that's right. Okay, not so, you. so you like you. rich people where's who your buy politics. Where's your Goldman Sachs jacket at? We know your wife works there. You know Donald Trump had a million dollar judgment against him for hiring illegal aliens. You know what he's doing right now in Florida? 
He brings in hundreds of foreign workers instead of hiring Americans. Sir, with all respect, Donald Trump is deceiving you. He is playing you for a chump. You'll find out tomorrow. So, Indiana don't want you. Sir, America is a better country without you. Thank you for those kind sentiments. Let me point out, I have treated you respectfully the entire time. And a question that everyone here should ask. Are you Canadian? Do you want your Canadian? Are you Canadian? Do you What's your reaction? Mm. Uh, that was painful. Mm. Uh, and I think in the final, final days of a, of a campaign like this, and we might be at the final days, it is hard. I mean, it has been a difficult uh, couple of weeks for Ted Cruz, and, and Trump has had his difficult weeks where it seems like you can't get out of your own way, and uh, it, this happens. This kind of stuff happens. I'm not going to pile on Ted Cruz, but I think what, ha what happens in these scenarios is, especially when you're someone like uh, Cruz, who's so, who is so smart, he's a champion debater, you feel like if, if you just debate that person, it's going to work out. But we don't, we don't elect uh, champion debaters. We, we elect people on the basis of a whole bunch of different factors. And it was very interesting there to see Harvard, Harvard Law in Princeton versus kind of a working man. And just in that, in that little microcosm, it was an interesting, um, I think it was a very interesting moment because you get the sense from those Trump supporters, they think this is their last stand. Maybe this is their last fight for America. And with Cruz, he thinks same thing. Look, if I don't win, Donald Trump, he believes is going to do all this liberal stuff and the country's going to go down the tubes anyway. So that, while it was painful, it was, it was a little bit instructive too. But you, know, you generally don't want to get into a debate with a protester or a heckler. That, generally, that doesn't work out so well. And he was just really a Trump supporter that, that Ted Cruz chose oh, to supporter, engage. Right. Yeah. Of course, yeah. All right, let's look ahead because the Rasmussen poll, it shows Trump actually beating Hillary Clinton now, 41% to 39%. What do you make of that? Because that is, those haven't been the numbers in the past, Laura. Well, I've said for a long time that whether it's Cruz or Trump, once the party starts to unify behind one person, you're going to see these numbers uh, get much closer than they were. And I think even in, in California, a state that has seen its party battered uh, over the last really 18, 20 years almost, um, things, things perhaps are beginning to shift. People think that we've gotten so close to the edge of fiscal insolvency, uh, open borders, bad trade deals, unresponsive government, that we, we, whatever we do, we have to shake things up. So <clears throat> I think Hillary is, is, you know, obviously comes off to a lot of people is not very likable. Trump has uh, problems in that arena as well in that area as well. So I, I think it's, you know, a friend of mine was joking, he doesn't like Trump or Hillary, said this is going to be the first presidential race that's an unpopularity contest. Uh, I don't know if I totally buy that, but I but, think these numbers are going to be very close, and, uh, and it, that didn't surprise me. Yeah, and, but when it comes to electoral map, let's see if Donald Trump can flip anything from red to right. blue. He was on with us earlier, kind of optimistic about what he's going to do today. People are listening to me. They're listening to me on the military. They're listening to me on my policies on China and all of these countries that are just killing the United States. Do you look at Indiana where carriers leaving for Mexico, Carrier Air Conditioning Corporation leaving for Mexico. I've been talking about it for months. And so I'm not surprised to see this poll. I'll beat Hillary. Cruz can't beat Hillary. Don't forget, I'm, I beat her with all these negative ads they're doing. If Kasich ever had a negative ad, he'd drop the rock. Laura? Yeah, well, I think that uh, it is true that tr Trump has gotten more negative ads. He's gotten more, more press time probably than a lot of uh, you know, the other candidates in the past. But he's also been hammered. He's been the subject of, of demonstrations. I mean, even on the cover, the front page of the Washington Post today, there's a piece. The title is, Trump bid raises prospect of nasty general election. So his, I mean, as if, as if the Clintons don't know nasty. I mean, they're the ones who came up with the war room, remember, in 1992? But because Trump's in there, it's going to be nasty. So for all my, uh, all my pals out there who said, yo, Trump's a big liberal, he's just a liberal, he's going to do liberal stuff. Well, clearly the, the liberals don't think he's a liberal because they're, they're, they're going to fight him with everything they have, and, and he better be ready for it. Steve? Laura, it's, it's interesting because uh, Hillary Clinton said yesterday, if, it, if the matchup is uh, Trump-Hillary, what's going to happen there? She says that she'll bring her husband, the former president, out of retirement to give her a hand at the White House. Listen to this. 
I told my husband that uh, if I'm so fortunate enough as to be president, I want him to do nothing but work uh, as hard as he can because he did a pretty good job when he was president, created a lot of jobs. And I said I wanted him to really take this on. You'll get sick of seeing him because that's He said exactly. he still has some pep in his step. Yeah, he has some pep <laughs> in his step. And this gets him really, uh, really excited because there's nothing he wants to do more. Wait a second, wait a second. I thought, Laura, I thought I Trump I th wait, I th I thought Trump was so easy to beat. I thought Trump was the easiest yes, candidate, exactly. the one they really wanted to beat. Now she looks a little nervous. I mean, the damsel in distress. you got got to bring Bill off the bench. Well, last time Bill came off the bench, it didn't end up so well for him. So I, I, don't, I, don't, uh, yeah. I don't think that's going to be that difficult. And I think if Hillary is trying to argue that the 90s economy is the kind of economy she's going to have, well, I... I think that's going to be a difficult lift because we know we've had flat GDP, non-existent GDP under the Obama, you know, Hillary regime in, uh, in, in Washington recently. And I think she's going to try to resurrect the Obama magic from the 90s. Uh, I, I just don't see that playing all that convincingly. Yeah. Let's reinvent the internet and get a tech bubble and let it burst four years afterwards uh, like exactly. happened in the 90s. Uh, Laura, so much to discuss. Uh, sadly, we're out of time. And Steve's hungry again. So Steve's asked oh, us to end this eat. segment <laughs> and toss an hour. Thank you, Laura. Great to see Thanks. you. Are you Canadian? Do you, want your <laughs> Are you Canadian? Do you want your kids repeating the words of Donald Trump? Are you Canadian? That is great stuff. Are you Canadian? I want more else. Why did you so, not? That's so what I'm not. What's wrong with you? The whole you? place. <laughs> Are you Canadian? I'll, I'll say, Mike Halpern, what's he doing? I'll say two things. What's he doing? I've never seen anything like that. Oh, like my God. <laughs> and it's, it's reminiscent at the end of the Rubio campaign, right? At the end yeah. of the Rubio campaign when he went for, like, a whole different it thing. It went longer. Shake things up. Oh, yeah. You, but, I mean, you don't walk over no, to protest. And the minute the guy started doing, like, yeah. shtick, yeah. you leave. No, but who and is that guy? He's got great timing. Oh, yeah. That guy. Are, are, are you Canadian? Well, you are see, you that's the problem when you have the Shakespearean part. Pauses <laughs> or the pinter pauses, whichever they are. Leave room. You, oh, leave you room. leave room for a guy to get the question that if, everyone if, is if asking. That guy, are you, are you Canadian? Canadian? If that guy is not on Howard Stern by Thursday, we'll come to America. So, okay, so why did he do that, Mark? But I think why did he go over there? things up because the dynamics died great. But I, I mean, I've literally never seen a candidate do anything like that. Like I've seen people be heckled and walk over, like Joe the Plumber type situation. But you walk away. What is he going to to win them over with his Trump Princeton, supporters, his Princeton debate skills. I mean, it was. It oh was, my God! No, but but I, think I think Cruz is throwing be, everything against yeah. the wall. He can. He well, can throw. Right? Got him on the well, we got more. He really is. We got wow. more. You mentioned this ten-year-old. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Because you have a mind like a ten-year-old, you want to see this. This is Ted Cruz That's and a child hateful. from Sunday. That is hateful. Take Let's a look. talk about this. All right. Apparently, there's a young man who's having some problems. Thank you, son. You know, I appreciate your sharing your views. You know, one of the things that hopefully someone has told you is that children should actually speak with respect. In my household, when a child behaves that way, they get a spanking. Spanking? Did they no. just ask court to no. your own kid yeah. out? Yeah. No. Yeah. This is like Virgin and Monty. <laughs> Escort a 10 year old out? <laughs> this is what you wanted to stop Trump? That is what you thought would stop Trump. Think about this. Everybody think Mark about Alperin. this. Why? Let's go back to Mark Alpern. Mark Alpern. In the Mark world. Politics 101. You escort a 10 year old kid out and then lecture him and say you deserve a spank. I don't think you get a negative on the 10 year old. Maybe, <laughs> maybe that just. What is wrong with your party? Uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Mark. Just, it's just, it's not in. This is not cresting well for the Cruz campaign. <sighs> fighting with the ten-year-old, fighting with the the heckler. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't get, I don't get the whole thing. At least, but I will say this: there wasn't a Gary Bauer. Moment. I will say this: nobody no, fell off the no, stage. No, 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 no. I, I would, I would not be surprised. Not if, true. I don't know if the ten-year-old was sent by the Trump folks, but I would not be surprised mm -hmm. if. Some of this is mischief being created, not in a, not a, an organic fashion. <laughs> Do you think that the 10-year-old boy is a Roger Stone flunky? He might have been a midget. 
Jimmy Fallon called him Donald Trump's grandson. Okay, a new poll finds that Republican voters think Ted Cruz's selection of a running mate is less about the country and more about a gimmick. 83% tell the NBC News survey monkey online tracking poll that Cruz announced Carly the Arena as a way to revitalize his campaign. Just 16% say it's because she's the best vice presidential candidate. Meanwhile, Donald Trump is finding all sorts of ways to criti criticize Ted Cruz. Not sure why he needs to make an effort, no, honestly, because Ted Cruz Cruz is doing just fine by himself. Okay. On Sunday, Ted Cruz's running mate, Carly Fiorina, was introducing oh. Cruz when... Was she okay? She okay? Uh, yeah, oh, my she gosh. Okay. She turned and stumbled off the stage. Oh, she... Is she okay? <laughs> uh, Cruz's wife extended her arm toward Fiorina, and an aide walked over to help her. She's okay. Okay. But Ted Cruz, perhaps not noticing. Let's see. Because Ted Cruz tends to think about Ted Cruz, and he's caught up oratory and his handshaking well, I, 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 firmness I, 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 and that connection that I, I, is so fake that he has with people that he kept on shaking hands. Heidi was worried. Look, she saw. Heidi was sort of concerned. Ooh, she's she's worried. Let's go help her. Okay, so Q. Okay, then she's smiling, so she must be okay. Q Donald Trump. <laughs> she fell off the stage the other day. Did anybody see that? And Cruz didn't do anything. I was a... Even I would have helped her, okay? They just showed it to me, and I said, wow, that's really cruel. She fell off. She just went down. She went down a long way, right? And she went down right in front of him, and he was talking. He kept talking. He didn't even look like... That was a weird deal. <laughs> and I thought we weren't going to have anything to talk about today. You know, this whole thing is a this weird is deal. I mean, I, I mean, I mean he is right about that. Purse. This is a oh weird deal. God. The whole thing is oh a weird deal. God. Trump, Trump, Trump okay. loves doing play by play of the other campaign. Yeah. Uh, he loves he does. Yeah. He does. How could you not? Yeah. And how so, could you not? Know so, when his own party props up that to so try and bring I, him down. Here's a question. How pathetic. Here's a question. We had Jeb Bush, we had Marco Rubio, we had Scott Walker. I could go down the list. Chris Christie, who was a really great candidate in New Hampshire, one of the best. Uh, Carly had a strong run. You go down the list of candidates, and you really wonder, how did we end up here with Donald Trump versus Ted Cruz? I always thought it was Trump versus Bush, Jeb. or Trump versus Walker, right. or Trump versus Marco, Christy. but Trump versus Chris Christie. At one point, Trump versus Carly, but Trump versus Ted Cruz. Come a on, guy people. Especially ill equipped to be in the position and that he's liked. in right now. Mark Halpern, how did it happen? Voters want fundamental change, and they're really interested in candidates who like more of the same. I mean, Ted Cruz became the candidate of the um, the, the most ideological conservatives, I think. Um, and uh, he, he established that himself in that lane. But wasn't and the game rigged toward Cruz toward the end here? What do you mean? What do you mean? How? Just sort of the, the party in general, the way they were coordinating things, weren't they trying? Wasn't there a subtle rigging of the game? I don't think. I mean, they could have picked John the Kasich colluding. at one point the or Ted Cruz. Colluding. By the way, here's a national poll. That, yes, Donald Trump's uh, ceiling 56 uh, percent. But you only had two two choices. You had Ted Cruz or John Kasich. Mm -hmm. And for some really weird reason, Voters chose him? they didn't. I'm talking about the Republican establishment. Yeah. For some bizarre reason, the Republican establishment did not select the guy who had been the first budget chairman in a generation to balance a budget, the first budget chairman since the 1920s to balance a budget four years in a row, a successful two-term popular governor of Ohio, the most important swing state for Republicans now to win. And they go with Ted Cruz, the Republican establishment, yeah. instead of John Kasich. It's as if John Kasich is not a conservative. I mean, John it's Kasich bizarre. is pretty conservative. They, they didn't come close to picking John Kasich. Uh, Almost nobody from the establishment endorsed well, what is the Which, by the way, what is the establishment? Well, it, it has a lot of guys and, and some women with a lot of money who constantly pick losers. Losers. These people have wasted billions of dollars On over the past 20 years giving money to losers Total who they're losers. more comfortable with. So you just you, you just put out a definition of why Donald Trump, one of the many reasons why Donald Trump... And by the way, I'm right. not calling Ted That's Cruz right. a loser personally. I'm saying these, this Republican donor class has spent 20 years selecting losers, people that lose campaigns because they would rather have somebody they're comfortable with than somebody who can actually win. I think there's a Washington Post column here. Why don't you write that to okay. me? Uh, 
Um, Davidson, really quick. Let, let me ask Adam really quickly. And I know we got to go, but I'm just curious what policy of Donald Trump's, what economic policy of Donald Trump uh, 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 frightens you the most? I'd say the trade stuff is very trade frightening, stuff, yeah. um, and, and but the absolute black hole about how he views the most fundamental role of government in an economy, the complete lack of information, the lack of thinking as far as we can tell about that, the uncertainty, that really frightens What does he me. need to do uh, to, to assuage some of your concerns? I mean, look, if he, write, if he started announcing that I have a team of economic minds who are anyone's heard of who's who are not just business people out for their own self-interest but are you know proven people with a track record of, of thought you know right. um, that would be helpful if he started articulating a view that he's heard of monetary policy he knows that's probably the single most important thing a president will the next president will decide right. more important than the Supreme Court although that's pretty important too that those things saying anything at all that would let us say oh that's what he that's thinks about the economy all Make right more comfortable. thank you adam thank you thank you go eves michael go eves, oh, go eves. exactly oh, yeah. Tonight, we'll see if it's enough. And Chris Matthews in Washington, on top of the fact that no one anticipated a front runner named Trump, a, a challenger to Hillary Clinton, uh, who would have thunk we'd be here on a Tuesday night talking about the Indiana primary as pivotal as it is? Yeah. Well, let me stick my neck out and say that Donald Trump has made a big mistake today. Uh, this is going to hurt him in the general election. Oh, months ago, he talked about President Obama being an illegal immigrant, basically snuck into this country somehow and became an illegitimate president. And the right wing people sort of laughed that off and enjoyed it. And even John Boehner, the Speaker of the House, says, I don't tell people how to think. And they let that go. Well, today he accused his number one conservative opponent, the last man standing against him, Ted Cruz, of having a father who had a role in killing Jack Kennedy. Now, I tell you, that isn't a casual comment. Historically, the death of Kennedy was a serious blow to this country. Everyone who lived through it knew what it meant emotionally to this country and historically. To play that game, to read the National Enquirer headlines and to play that game, put that out there, I think is a big, big mistake. And the response from Cruz tonight was personal and I believe permanent. He said, you're a pathological liar to say something like that about my father. This may be the first time I've dear deeply sympathize with a candidate in this race, and that's with Ted Cruz. Nobody should have their family dragged into such a character assassination as that. And I think, I think Mr. Trump is going to pay for this in November with conservatives who are going to remember what he did to a fellow conservative. So that's my thinking tonight. Mm -hmm. Something really big happened today in the morning. All right, Back Chris to you. Matthew. Start with our favorite thing, the predictions game, as we all love. <laughs> as we all love. Barry, you had no problem throwing out some predictions before the New York primary. Yeah. What's your prediction today on delegates? It's going to be huge. Huge. How many? Do you think you guys, do you think realistically you get fit all 57? Uh, it's possible, but I mean, I'd be happy with half because um, we were counting on none three weeks ago. It so. has, the, the, the landscape has significantly changed, it seems, Steve. What do you, what do you, you think? Uh, Kate, I think the big story this morning is the ringing endorsement that came out of Ronald Reagan's oldest son, Michael, who came out today and urged Indiana voters to vote for Ted Cruz, saying that Donald Trump is no Ronald Reagan. The same Ronald Reagan who supported Jimmy Carter, uh, the same, I'm sorry, Donald Trump, who supported uh, Jimmy Carter against Ronald Reagan, who supported Walter Mondale, who ran ads, by the way, in major American newspapers in 1987, attacking but Steve, Trump Ronald Reagan's Holtz. foreign Trump policy. Got Lou Holt, Steve. Oh, wow. <laughs> but he attacked Ronald Reagan's foreign policy, saying those were bad deals. Those were the bad deals that basically brought the Soviet Union to its knees. This is a, a battleground for the conservative future of this country, because if, if Donald Trump does win tonight and pull out half the delegates, you're going to see a very different Donald Trump tomorrow. It's going to be that Donald Trump's going to look a lot more like Hillary Clinton than he does like Ronald Reagan. Yeah, but you didn't even tell me. <laughs> give, me a, give me a guesstimation on delegates. I, I think you Ted get more Cruz, than you got in New York. Ted Cruz is going to do very well tonight. He will outperform expectations like he always does. I don't believe the conservative base of this party is ready to throw everything over to, uh, to Donald Trump. In essence, we're not going to nominate Hillary Clinton with a penis. Steve. I said it. Steve. Yeah. Barry? Yeah. Steve? Uh, I don't Why really does this know always happen this. on my show? Why do you guys always throw around the crazy on my show? All I ask is for a delegate count. Going hard after Hillary Clinton. Even for victory speeches I saw the other night, Hillary Clinton, she's got a teleprompter. And I would say that she started screaming at the teleprompter, but I'm not allowed to say that. You know why? 
Now, if she was a man, I could say it. But as a woman, ladies, I'm sorry, I'm not allowed to say it. She was screaming at the teleprompter, but I will not say it, okay? Our latest poll shows Donald Trump's unfavorable rating with 69% of women voters. It's a key number as we look ahead to the general election. Let me bring in Katrina Pearson, national spokesperson for the Donald Trump campaign. Jess McIntosh, she's the spokesperson at Emily's List. Thank you both for joining us. And, and, and Katrina, I apologize, but I, do, I just have to ask you about this. We played what Donald Trump just said about Lee Harvey Oswald, about Ted Cruz's father. And I'm just, can you clarify for me? what he is trying to say or trying to suggest there. Well, it was just interesting because this was actually reported in the Miami Herald, which is probably why it came up, and he just thought, wow, this is actually happening and no one's talking about it. So really it was just a shock and awe that it showed up in the Miami Herald. Is there some suggestion, though, that his father had something to do with the Kennedy assassination? Oh, you know, I don't know, and I think that's why it was shocking and why Mr. Trump mentioned it when the Miami Herald reported it. So I guess there's, they're looking into that. All right. I, I just I want to make sure to get a, a question to you on that before uh, before we, we move on here. I thank you for, for uh, addressing that. So let me ask about the question here of female voters, the general election. We put the numbers up on the screen. Uh, uh, Katrina, when you see a number like that, basically seven in ten women voters have watched Donald Trump for the last year as a presidential candidate, and they've walked away with an unfavorable view. Why is that? Well, mainly it's because most of what Mr. Trump says is pulled out of context. And we saw unfavorable numbers like this at the beginning of the Republican primary. That gap was closed uh, quite quickly, within three months, I might add, after Mr. Trump was on the campaign trail, going to city to city and meeting people face to face. And now you'll see in the Republican primary that women are voting for him overwhelmingly. What about that? When you look at the, we have a general election number there, all women, uh, Democrat, Republican, mm -hmm. Independent, Donald Trump doing terribly. Katrina is saying, look, he took the campaign just to Republicans. He did fine with Republican women. He can turn it around with all women in the fall. What do you say to that? Yeah, I, I don't think there's a context that makes the names that Donald Trump calls women appropriate. And you don't get to numbers like 70% disapproval ratings on Democratic women alone. That means Republican women are rejecting him, too. So he seems to have calculated that he could win the Republican primary by making women a punchline. And that strategy seems to be paying off. But it's not a viable strategy in the general election. So I'm, I'm curious to see how he tries to, to back it up. We all know that the, the most effective campaigning you can do against an opponent is to use their own words in their own voice against them and we have so much to choose from from Donald Trump and he doesn't seem to be stopping what uh, Katrina so much has been made of this term Donald Trump uses the woman card says Hillary Clinton is playing the woman card all she has is the woman card what is the woman card well, you know, first I'd like to also say that unfavorables, that doesn't translate into to lack of votes. Hillary Clinton also has high unfavorables, which is why Bernie Sanders is winning the younger women, uh, simply because old-fashioned feminism isn't quite popular today. And just because you criticize a woman doesn't make you a sexist, and most women understand that today. The women's card is very simple. Hillary Clinton started out playing the woman's card. She talked about how uh, Senator Sanders criticized the way that she speaks. That was the woman card. She called Donald Trump a sexist. That was the woman's card. And now all she's talking about is paid family medical leave and equal pay. She's not talking about foreign policy because she can't. That's what Mr. Trump is talking about. She wants to talk about women's issues because she cannot run on her record. What do you say to that, Jess? Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State. Of course she can talk about foreign policy. But if we're going to, to put family medical leave and ending gender discrimination in pay and reproductive access to health care in, in some sort of woman card box, that's largely one of the reasons why Donald Trump is turning off so many women. The, the wage gap for women is a big issue for Republican women. To dismiss that as something that is pandering just ignores that a lot of women are really hurting and they want to do right by them and their families. That's why Hillary Clinton is talking about what she wants to do to help raise the economic viability for women. That helps families is that helps the entire country it's an economic argument and it's a powerful one yeah, and, and, but the and, problem with that but the problem with that is these are the same arguments that Hillary's been making for nearly 40 years her husband was president of the United States for two terms the Democrats have been in charge for the last eight years and for the first part of Obama's term they had full 
control over the government, and we're still having the same issues addressed. So why should a woman think that because Hillary Clinton is all of a sudden the president, that these things are magically going to get fixed when they have failed at every attempt prior to that? J Jess, uh, Katrina raised this, and we, we played this in the clip from Donald Trump as well. He said in that clip, uh, uh, he says, Hillary Clinton's shouting, and then he says, but I'm not allowed to say that. I'm not going right. to say that. And, and Katrina is saying, look, you, just because you attack a woman in politics doesn't make you a, a, a sexist. Is, is there anything to that that Hillary Clinton uses or Hillary Clinton supporters use her gender as a shield from attacks that would be fair game against a male politician? Uh, sure. I mean, Hillary Clinton has been attacked more than just about any politician in America over the last 30 years, and she's got some of the toughest skin in the business. Um, but I do think that there isn't a woman out there who doesn't understand that there's, there's a double standard when it comes to, to shouting and women raising their voices. And every time Donald Trump decides to criticize Carly Fiorina's face or Hillary Clinton's voice, or he calls women dogs and fat pigs and slobs, I, I, women know what that means and they know the character of the man saying it. Do you think there see, is... That's my point, Steve. Some of those comments she just stated were in a television program for entertainment purposes. Those are the types of comments that are pulled out of context. Those are the types of comments that are pulled out of context and what actually started the disagreement between Donald Trump and Megyn Kelly because that was his TV personality. Mr. Trump has had m many public fights with women and men, but we don't hear about him talking about Rand Paul's hair or some other man for that matter. You guys just want to focus on women. But here's the thing. Criticism of a woman is not sexism. Mr. Trump also praises many women. He has one of the first to, to put women in executive positions in, a, in corporate America. It's not going to work. Right. And Jess, I gave Katrina the first word. I'll give you the last word. Look, I, I don't envy her having to defend this stuff, and I think it's pretty obvious why we are looking at women with a 70% disapproval rating of that candidate. All right, Katrina Pearson, Jess of the lead. I'm Jake Tapper. What a day it has been. We're just two hours away from polls closing in Indiana and the stakes could not be higher in the Republican race for the presidential nomination. If Ted Cruz and the anti-Trump forces cannot stop Trump in the Hoosier state, they may not be able to stop him at all. Befitting the stakes, Trump and Cruz engaged in a bitter and stunning exchange today. Every time you think this race cannot get any more ludicrous, it does. This latest episode started this morning when Trump cited a bizarre and completely uncorroborated report, and I use the term report loosely, in the National Enquirer, the supermarket tabloid. The National Enquirer, which has endorsed Trump and is published by a friend of Trump's, has been launching smear after smear against Cruz and his family. This story shows a photograph from August 1963 of a man standing with soon-to-be John F. Kennedy assassin Lee Harvey Oswald, handing out pro-Castro literature and the story suggests that the man is Cruz's father, Raphael. Now, the problem is there's really no proof that the photograph is, in fact, Cruz's dad. And Cruz's dad says it is not him. Nonetheless, Mr. Trump called into the Fox Morning Show this morning and said the following. His father was with Lee Harvey Oswald prior to Oswald's being... Uh, you know, shot. I mean, the whole thing is ridiculous. What, what, what is this right prior to his being shot? And nobody even brings it up. I mean, they don't even talk about that. That was reported, uh, and nobody talks about it. What was he doing with Lee Harvey Oswald right. shortly before the death, uh, before the shooting? I cannot believe I need to say the following, but here goes. There is no corroborated evidence that Ted Cruz's father ever met Lee Harvey Oswald, or for that matter, any other presidential assassin. We in the media don't talk about it because there's no evidence of it. In fact, there is contrary evidence. Well before the picture was taken, Rafael Cruz's sister was brutally beaten by Castro forces, and Rafael Cruz had denounced the regime so any suggestion that Cruz's father played a role in the Kennedy assassination is ridiculous and, frankly, shameful. Now, that's not an anti-Trump position or a pro-Cruz pro position. It's a pro-truth position.
the National Choir is once again attacking GOP presidential hopeful Ted Cruz. The tabloid believes they have uncovered photographic proof that Ted Cruz's father, Rafael Cruz, spent time with the John F. Kennedy assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald, promoting the Fidel Castro regime. The publication had photograph experts compare images of a mystery man photographed with Oswald in New Orleans to that of Rafael taken during the same year and believe it is a match. Now the tabloid is calling out Cruz's father for spending time with Oswald and promoting Castro propaganda to the American public. To prove their claims, the tabloid took photographs of Rafael Cruz from around 1963 and compared them to that of the mystery man in the video taken back in 1963, featuring a number of men alongside future John F. Kennedy assassin Lee Harvey Oswald. The publication claims that multiple experts in photograph and forensics have confirmed that the man in the Oswald video is Rafael Cruz. Though the National Enquirer captivated audiences with the seemingly definitive headline, Ted Cruz father linked to JFK assassination, the tabloid had no further evidence of the connection outside of the single video. Ted Cruz has vehemently denied that his father is the man in the photo, claiming the National Enquirer story is nothing but garbage. Though he says his father is not the man in the photograph, he does admit that his father once attempted to join Fidel Castro's guerrilla army in Cuba. In Ted Cruz's book, A Time for Truth, the presidential candidate says his Cuban father only wanted to join Castro, believing he was going to save the country. He claims his father had no knowledge that Castro planned to lead the nation with communism. After being unable to locate Castro's army in the mountains, Rafael Cruz fled to Texas where he later denounced Fidel Castro. Rafael has also admitted that he was duped by Castro, noting that he didn't realize the future leader was a communist. What do you think about the latest Ted Cruz tabloid story? This is the first of a series of Latin listening post interviews with persons more or less directly concerned with the conflict between the United States and Cuba. In subsequent programs, we will present talks with people who are connected with the Cuban refugee organizations, people who are connected with President Batista, and U.S. citizens with direct stakes in the outcome of the Cuban situation. Tonight we have with us a representative of probably the most controversial organization connected with Cuba in this country. The organization, the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. The person, Lee Oswald, secretary of the New Orleans chapter to the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. This organization has long been on the Justice Department's blacklist and is a group which is generally considered to be the leading pro-Castro body in the nation. 